Coming up when I came up, there were a golden age for modern piano. I, I really do. I thought that then, and it's even more apparent looking back. And so the guys that I initially listened to, uh, or at least from, from the immediate era, was McCoy Tyner, Keith Jarrett, Chick, uh, and Herbie, along with their predecessors and some of my peers. But those, those four had a particular impact. And uh, so, sure, I listened a ton to all, all of them. So I, I think on, on, in varying repertoires and times, there, there's, there's likely to be a, a hint, uh, at least, of, of, of those guys. When I left Long Island in New York, I went to Boston. And actually, that, that's really where I uh, learned how to play and heard some of my, to this date, early inspirations. Uh, as it turns out, heard, heard Jocko's debut record my first year there where, with uh, Portrait of Tracy and songs, which I, I actually, uh, that song, which I actually recorded on this album and really practiced in Boston. So that was late 70s. It was an amazing piece and it captivated everyone just because of the harmonics and the complexity of the harmony he was doing on solo bass. And so, just in recent years, I've decided to revisit his music from the head Jocko as the composer perspective, not as the bass player, because I think that's uh, overshadowed him almost as a composer, is his reinvention of the bass. And somehow people always want to play his music as if he were playing the bass in it. So when I started thinking about it, I said, no, I want to make piano trio arrangements that have nothing to do with this bass playing and give it to an upright bass player and just say, play the roots, you know, it's just a cool Brazilian sounding tune, but don't, don't get hung up on what he was doing. And so Portrait of Tracy, we wound up doing uh, as a piano trio, again, as if it's some straight eighthy latin -y feeling thing. And I do all the harmony and just let the bass player play the bass. It was actually after getting back from Europe in 1985 that I started writing music. Prior to that, I had never really thought of myself as, as a composer. I, more, more along the lines of what Bill Evans did or something, stylized standards and stuff. And I didn't seem to compose much uh, at that point. And I got back from Europe and they started just pouring out, which was uh, an interesting opening up of a sort. Somehow, when I started composing, it, it, it probably took what I really knew well, which was standard tunes, and standard jazz tunes, of course, you know. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm hearing words, but I'm definitely thinking in terms of a melody that you sort of walk around and you're singing to. So combining the, the harmony of, of that 60s generation of piano players, there, Her Herbie and, and, and Keith, and with, with the, the melodic elements of standards, and I guess that was the, the early basis unconsciously for when I started writing when I was getting into this music, guys were not really playing assertively in odd meters. You know, I did many years of all sorts of gigs and this and that and this and that, and I sort of came out of the hotel and started checking out a lot of the, the guys that had been coming up. They, they were already well established, but I hadn't spent that much time listening to them. I went back and started hearing a whole lot of odd meter applications, and I got really obsessed with it. I just loved the, the, the freedom these swamp odd, odd meter grooves on jazz classics and, and standards. And so it has a mixture of this 7-4 thing that gets turned around every other measure, which makes an intro that I think is pretty cool and deceptive. And then when it's time for the, the soloing stuff, you know, the angular side, I, I guess, of McCoy and Train is underlying it. But uh, I think it combines a lot of things which uh, I think keeps it fresh, which is what all of us are trying to do, I think, is, you know, personalize some of the standard jazz repertoire.